uh, it will probably lead, I'm afraid, to many, many uh, more deaths as different factions in Afghanistan try to fight back and forth. Uh, and to a fractured, unstable country. Almost the worst period in Afghanistan was not the Taliban period, it was the civil war period that preceded it from 91 to 95, when all these different groups were fighting. The idea now of trying to do anything like what the US has been doing for 20 years is forget it, it's finished. But there are things that we can try to do to make the situation at least not get much worse. I like focusing on things which are quite small and tangible, where I feel I can make a difference to a few hundred lives, instead of pretending I can change the lives of millions. We have a question from Dani Putra Pratama from Sukuba uh, University. Mr. Rory, related to the pro-government warlords, do you think that another wave of civil war is possible within Afghanistan in the future? If so, uh, is there any chance that the Taliban would demand foreign fighters to join the cause, such as ISIS uh, did back uh, in the early 2010s? Anyways, I'm enjoying this session very much. Thank you, Pat Rory. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a very good question, really good question. Um, I, at the moment, the Taliban control about 90% of Afghanistan, in theory. I mean, control is a very uncertain word in Afghanistan. But the Panjshir Valley, which is the Tajik Panjshiri stronghold, is currently controlled by the former government. So Amrullah Saleh, who was the, um, been various different roles, Defense Minister of Interior, Minister Vice President, is now calls himself the president of Afghanistan. And the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud, who fought against the Taliban in the uh, 1990s, is now claiming command. So there's a, a valley there, a big, big valley, with a lot of people who are beginning to set up a resistance to the Taliban. There will be temptations on other warlords and regional uh, players to swap sides. And this is a very difficult thing to assess what will happen. I think if it does happen, you know, let's say some neighboring countries decided to start funding resistance against the Taliban, providing intelligence people money to the Panjshir Valley to try to fight the Taliban. There is a very strong possibility of civil war. And of course, that will make the Taliban even more paranoid and even more violent because they will then be searching in Kabul and elsewhere for anybody that could be associated with this opposition to them. Uh, it will probably lead, I'm afraid, to many, many uh, more deaths as different factions in Afghanistan try to fight back and forth. Uh, and to a fractured, unstable country, almost the worst period in Afghanistan was not the Taliban period, it was the civil war period that preceded it from 91 to 95 when all these different groups were fighting. So it's a, it's a horrible choice, but one of the things that Western policymakers need to think about seriously is whether a Taliban government is not preferable to a civil war. That's a horrible thing to say, because as I've just said, there are so many things that are horrifying potentially about a Taliban government. But a civil war uh, that dragged on for years might be even worse. Hmm. Okay, uh, we have a question from Jaya Suparman from University of uh, Muhammadiyah, uh, Yogyakarta. What do you think Afghanistan has done wrong in the last 20 years in terms of building their uh, power? It seems they have anything... Uh... Okay, uh, I don't understand the, the, the next uh, line of questions, but... Uh... State building, what? maybe. So maybe, maybe it's a question about state building, nation building in Afghanistan. I mean, I mm. think the answer there is that creating a modern state is very, very, very difficult and takes a very long time and it's very painful. And Indonesia is a good way of thinking about it. If you think about where Indonesia was in the late 1940s, early 1950s, trying to struggle to bring together so many diverse communities, languages, areas, in a sense, Afghanistan was in a similar state. And it was maybe in an even more difficult state than Indonesia because it found itself in a particularly dangerous neighborhood where everybody was interfering, particularly the fight, the Cold War fight between the Soviet Union and the United States. I mean, I think that the thing that really broke Afghanistan, by the 1970s, Afghanistan was on a path which was reasonable, not completely different, not completely different to the type of path, I apologize, somebody's tried to telephone. Um, 
not completely different to the type of path that, for example, I don't know, by the 1970s, Bangladesh might have been on, or even, even countries like Sri Lanka might have been on. Um, so it's, uh, I think the breaking point was the decision from uh, the Soviet Union to invade, and then the US backed resistance to Soviet Union that created essentially the next 40, 50 years of civil war. And so Afghanistan state building in that situation, when you have had no state for 20 years, when your entire population is armed, when only very few people can read and write, when you have, you know, when I walked from Herat to Kabul, there was no electricity between Herat and Kabul, you're starting from an incredibly low base. Uh, and the sorts of problems that most developing countries have. I mean, remember, there are still insurgencies in India, there are still insurgencies in Nigeria, there are still insurgencies in Pakistan. Corruption is not just something that happens in Afghanistan. I mean, you know, President Biden keeps saying the whole thing was a waste of time because of corruption. No, come on. I mean, there's corruption, bad corruption in most countries in the world. And in the developing world, certainly unbelievable corruption in almost every poor developing country. So. The idea that Afghanistan was unique on that point of view is, is crazy, but it was a very, very difficult place to turn around. And the problem is not the Afghan people, the problem is conflict. Once conflict and violence starts, and you can see this in Syria, you can use, lose years of economic advancement very quickly. Hmm. You know, Rory, I've been talking to my friends uh, from around Asia on, on Afghanistan, and there seems to be a prevailing mindset here and the mindset is like this look uh the americans with all their military might couldn't uh, couldn't uh, stay yeah uh and they have given up on nation building right so there's nothing if americans can't with all their resources can't do anything neither can we uh so the most realistic option now is just to make sure nothing that the taliban does can disrupt regional order and stability, spill over to the uh, outside the territory, their borders. But whatever happens inside, God willing, right? Uh, yeah. We just close our eyes and, yeah. but so long yeah. as it doesn't spill over to regional order. Uh, so I, is I, that the I, right I, perspective? I, uh, I think there's some wisdom in it, but probably you could probably do a little bit more. So I think you're absolutely right that the most practical approach, and I think this is probably going to be China's approach, is to say, let's try to contain the situation and stop it spreading too far. But it's certainly worth other countries reaching out to try to see if there are links into the Taliban. It's certainly worth trying to provide humanitarian development assistance, because if Afghanistan collapses into civil war and horror, that will push refugees out of the country will create much more instability. It's much more likely to send up hosting terrorist groups. So I think the international community should try in the short term to see if it can do things to be generous and stabilize and support. But that's not nation building, of course. Right? We shouldn't get involved in nation building. The idea now of trying to do anything like what the US has been doing for 20 years is forget it, it's finished. But there are things that we can try to do to make the situation at least not get much worse. Mm. Don't get so pessimistic and cynical that we just think it, it's such a disaster, it can't get any worse. It can get much, much worse. Mm. Um, and it, it's a tragic truth, but if Afghanistan descends into civil war, it's going to be 10 times worse than the situation we have now. So if, if there's anything that uh, other countries can do to try to make it slightly more likely that things don't deteriorate further. It's worth doing. Yeah. We have a question from Anton Alifandi. Uh, Mr. Rory, what is the likelihood of Afghanistan again becoming a training ground for Islamic militants as it did in the 1990s? Or they have learned their lessons? Yeah. Very difficult to know. I mean, the Taliban keeps saying they've learned their lesson. And uh, we hope they have. And definitely, if terrorist training camps were set up again, uh, the Taliban would be aware that they're likely to be hit very hard uh, by the US. It's difficult to, and maybe the, the world of big terrorist training camps um, is a little different to what it was before 2001. Um, however, 
it depends how isolated the Taliban becomes. It depends which faction in the Taliban takes over ideologically. At the moment, they are fighting the Islamic State in Afghanistan. One of their problems was they released all the prisoners from all these jails as they went down the country. And a lot of the people they've released have been Islamic State prisoners. So around Chaki, the Taliban were fighting the Islamic State a few days ago. So these Al-Qaeda Islamic State tensions are going to erupt. And there's still a significant Islamic State presence in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, the question is, from the point of view, obviously, of the US interests, is this going to become an international terrorist threat or is it a, a more regional threat? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's let's move out of Afghanistan and talk about uh, fun stuff, Rory. <laughs> you know, you and I have something in common, right? That we were both diplomats uh, and at some point in our life, we left diplomacy and got into politics a little bit, right? Uh, I, I got into politics, I totally did not enjoy it. And I left politics after only about a year or so, right? Uh, so I, now, now I'm much happier being a professional and you know, leading a nonprofit uh, foreign policy group. Right? But, but you went in politics big time. Uh, you became minister uh, for international development, minister for prisons too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you ran for, you competed for the prime minister office against uh, Boris Johnson and, and many others. So, so uh, tell me, uh, do you think that was the right decision? Uh, leaving diplomacy uh, for uh, politics and, and uh, was it worth the, uh, was it worth the, uh, the journey here? I, I, it was punishing and painful and uh, I feel that 10 years of my life was some of the worst 10 years I've ever lived. I think probably the worst 10 years of my life. <laughs> I, I, I find being a politician uh, exhausting and very bad for your body and mind and soul. And I think contemporary politics in Britain and the United States is particularly bad. I mean, I think the fundamental problem is that the, what you have to do to get elected uh, completely distorts your character and changes you as a human being and makes it much less easy for you to actually be good in government. So to be good in government, you need to think critically and clearly, but to be elected, you need to produce very, very strange, bogus confidence, optimism, nonsense. I mean, so the tension between the way that you end up speaking and thinking to get elected and the way you need to speak and think to run a country well is, is almost impossible at the moment in, in Western societies. Yeah. Um, however, as a public servant, as somebody who cared about Britain and wanted to serve my country, and I'd been a soldier and a diplomat and this and the other, I couldn't really avoid becoming a politician because I felt um, that as a civil servant, I was taking the instructions from the politicians. I felt here were these people, for example, screwing up Afghanistan. And I, in order to really change it, I needed to be at the top. So, you know, I became a foreign, foreign office minister. I then became Secretary of State for International Development. As you say, I was also an environment minister and prisons minister. Um, the, all these things were fascinating for me. Uh, fascinating, of course, for those of you on the phone who were civil servants to realize actually how little power politicians have and actually how strange the relationship is between the two. The civil servants often feel frustrated and powerless, and the politicians also feel frustrated and powerless, and nobody really knows where the power lies. There's no need to be an idealistic uh, person, uh, Rory. You know, you're always talking about you know, saving the world and <laughs> things like that. I, your experience uh, in, in, in politics, did that temper your sense of idealism? Uh, somehow, or well, it did not. I, I think it. I think it certainly. It hasn't tempered my idealism, but it certainly made me much more depressed. I mean, it certainly <laughs> has destroyed my confidence, in my own ability to change uh -huh. the world. I mean, it's it's um, it's made me focus now on running a much smaller nonprofit. Now we're moving to Jordan to work with Syrian refugees, Palestinians, Jordanians, uh, and I like focusing on things which are quite small and tangible, where I feel I can make a difference to a few hundred lives instead of pretending I can change the lives of millions. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree because, uh, you know, that's what I'm doing now with my group uh, from just 12 people. Now we're the largest uh, foreign policy group in Indonesia and, and Southeast Asia. And I feel that I'm my own boss and whatever I have that I want to translate into the, the, the world, I can do it without asking anybody's permission. 
right? And, and that's an uh, amazing value uh, for me uh, uh, in comparison with working with the government or as a, a politician. But, but surely, uh, Rory, uh, you know, you're still young, your kids are still uh, four and six, right? And uh, are, are you going back to politics? Uh, you, you know, the, the, the office of the prime minister is a very sexy uh, <laughs> title. I would love to visit London and stay over at 10 Downing Street if you're there, you know, right? So, sure. so is that well, a possibility? Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I think we're coming to the very answer to my last answer, but I think the answer is you would be very, very welcome, but I would need to get a lot more energy and confidence back before I tried that again. And yeah. thank you so much for having me. It was a thank really you, Thank really you. Great. Rory, it's been amazing. Uh, and I, it's been a pleasure to be your friend. And I hope uh, you will come visit Indonesia again one day. And please uh, do, do what you do. Uh, it's really inspiring for, for me and, and all my staff to, to see you and I send my best to Shoshana and, and your two kids. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Rory. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And much, much love to your family. Prima Bye -bye.